Hello, I am Shane Brinkman Davis de la Moore, and this is Code and Optimism, a show where we explore how to solve problems faster with software. Today, I have a special treat for you. I got a chance to sit down with my good friend Mike Kelly from membervault.co and talk a bit about Linux. Now, one of the things that's really important with getting software done quickly is working in an environment that gets out of your way and lets you focus on the problem at hand and stay productive. Now I've used Linux in the past, but I admit I'm not really used it as a daily driver since, I don't know, about the year 2000 maybe. And Linux has come a long way since then. And Mike has switched over to it full time a little while ago. And so we're gonna talk a bit about his journey and his experiences and show how those of us using other operating systems might want to reconsider Linux once again. So with that, let's dive into the interview, and I hope you enjoy it. Mike, I would love to hear just a little bit about where you're at right now and sort of how you got here as we lead into today's topic, which is Linux. I love it. I love it. Um, well, as a developer, I mean, I've been a developer since, oh God, fifth grade. I remember doing GW Basic in the computer lab after <laughs> school. That yeah. was like the one club I did after school was like programming. And I've just been obsessed with it ever since. Um, and then I still remember, like, you know, I went to college for computer, uh, what do they call it, computer engineering or like, <laughs> this, I they, computer science. It was like this weird umbrella term back in the 90s that covered all of computers. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I still remember my first job out of college, I was introduced to PHP and like, and I thought it was amazing that you could write software and put it on a server and then all your clients get the update. Like it's, you know, remember this is back yeah. in the AOL CD days where you, <laughs> if you wanted to send someone an update, you had to mail them a disc or a CD yeah. or something. <laughs> so this, this just blew my mind and I was really addicted after that. And so ever since then, truly, uh, I've been a PHP developer and I still am. <laughs> so yeah, we've had lots of good of conversations around that, right? I think that yeah, it's, yeah. it's a many really well-developed platform. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a, it's a very well-documented platform. And, you know, again, it's one of those things where, um, you know, if it works, go for it. Uh, and PHP has been fortunate enough to be uh, have a bunch of uh, platforms frameworks built in it too, WordPress being the biggest one. So uh -huh. big chunk of my career was, um, you know, was a high end WordPress developer. So developing themes and plugins and stuff like that, because that was the ecosystem that was, and I assume still is thriving. Um, but I always like to custom stuff. And so um, <laughs> about six and a half years ago, you know, my wife was working with a, um, you know, an entrepreneur and she was lamenting over the fact that like all the course platforms out there, like they were either way overkill and way expensive, or they were like junk. <laughs> they were like a, a WordPress plugin that like kind of sort of worked, but like was super janky. Yeah. And uh, I kind of off the cuff was like, well, I could program that in a weekend, you know, like I can make, I can make a course. <laughs> I could do that. That's easy. I could do that. <laughs> and, uh, and so we, you know, so they actually called my bluff and, um, six years, I'm still working on it, but <laughs> yeah, so that was uh, six years ago. So I am, I'm the developer and CTO of a platform called member vault. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's for creators that want to sell digital courses, trainings, any kind of digital products. Um, yeah. you know, the, the people you might know in the space are like teachable Kajabi, Thinkific, you know, all of that, even gum road. I know it's a big one too for delivering, selling and delivering um, content. So, um, and it's all built in PHP because uh, that was the tool chain that I knew at the time. And uh, yeah, and so it's it's still running, it's still running great. Um, so that's kind of my background on yeah. how I've become a developer and, and what I'm doing these days. Yeah, super cool. And uh, you, uh, uh, just thinking about your sort of path to Linux here, and I'm going to sort of dive into a bit mm -hmm. more, but I know we've talked a little bit of, a lot about just your, your hosting journal uh, journey. Yeah. And, you know, you you were sort of basically hosting on bare metal Linux, and you sort of evolved since then to leveling that mm -hmm. up. Um, but sort of roll back to your early days of working on Linux, and then yeah. sort of then you were using, you know, a non-Linux machine, Mac, uh, locally, but you were using Linux for server, and now you've transitioned yeah. even further. So tell me about your path. Sure. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I grew up on Windows 95, 98, 90, whatever, you know, the whole day. Um, and then I, I do remember it still at that time, you would actually have to push to a Linux server and you had a, an actual machine in a rack. Yep. You know, this is pre AWS <laughs> days, yep, Azure days or whatever, where like you owned a little thing in a, in a data center and you had to SSH into it and do stuff. So, I mean, that was my first kind of run in with Linux. And I imagine most developers, that's kind of how they know Linux is like, you know, SSHing into a server and like pushing something around. Of course, these days, I don't think developers even do that so much, but um, it does sometimes happen. So yeah, that was my thing. And then I got my first Mac, I think right when they were switching to Intel, it was right around that transition time where I was exposed to Mac and I fell in love. Yeah. I thought this was, this is amazing. This is end game for me. Um, <laughs> and I actually, and I actually liked that Mac was more Linux like, Yeah. For sure. um, you know, so it's BSD based. So it, it, it's very Unix. It's more Unix flavored than Windows, that's for sure. Yep. And I always liked that because it felt like I was closer to the environment that I was gonna work in in sure. the server. Yeah. So like no DIR slash W, it was just LS. So I'm like, of course, yeah. yes, this knows LS and my server knows LS, like that's Great. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I switched to Mac and I was on a Mac for 15 years yeah. uh, at just about, and it was right around Big Sur when Big Sur came out. Um, it broke my local dev environment. I still had not, I still had not embraced Docker. Yeah. So I was still using onboard Apache and onboard PHP, yeah. um, you know, for this stuff, which was cooked in the Mac OS for a long time, apparently. And so you just had to edit config files and right. you were, right. you were up and going. And, uh, and I think it was a big sir where like they pulled all that out. Yeah. And not only did they pull it out, they said like PHP is unsafe or something. They 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 kind of <laughs> they kind of threw some shade at my boy PHP. Right. I was like, <laughs> you suck, Mike. We're not going to support you anymore. All right. I was like, well, that's a little harsh. <laughs> um, and yeah, and I remember it was oh, and you know, uh, at that time too, right when Big Sur came out, and anyone who's a developer who uses Mac OS knows that like sometimes homebrew lags a little bit behind the upgrade and i was upgraded really fast yeah. um but i upgraded but homebrew was still very broken right and i was so frustrated i was like i can't get anything done like yeah. i'm yeah. i'm stuck in the water here yeah. um and i was already a little one foot out the door because i i didn't like the keyboard and none I didn't of us like did the... no it was none it was of terrible. us did it was a shady yeah, yeah. shady years there <laughs> yeah it was like, like i had a bad keyboard and a touch bar i didn't use and i was like this is this is dumb and <laughs> cloud on me all the time and i was like all right i'm i'm not that bought in yeah and um but i had a mac mini at the time too like for a desktop yeah. and i remember I, I, I was so frustrated that out of desperation, I was like, I wonder, and I've always played around with Linux on the side. Yeah. Linux has always been like a little side. Yeah. Gee whiz, like when my parents break a laptop and they give it to me, and because they like they buy a new one or my brother gives them one. Like yeah. when people give me broken computers, I fix yeah. them up. Yeah, that's and one of the cool I, things I really like that you do on this side, right? You just take anyone's old computer. He's like, can I can I make this usable again? And yeah. and, and then you do. And Linux is the lightest way to do it, right? And so that yeah. And then you give it out to other people so they have a computer, like a little something to access the internet. I think that's such a cool little service you do for the community. Yeah, and that started with literally that started with my parents giving me the like a Lenovo Yoga two or yeah. something like that. Some Lenovo, you know, computer. It had one of those hybrid drives in it. It was like solid state and a spinning rust oh, in the yeah. same yeah. in the same thing. And and that thing went kaput like they do. Yeah. And um so I replaced the drive and then I was like, well, all right, what do I do with this? I was still a Mac user. Yeah. You know, I wasn't gonna put Windows on it because I'm still grossed out by Windows. Yeah. Um yeah. <laughs> no offense to the Windows users out there. It's not not my thing. Not your jam, and, not my jam, but it is other people's. It's other people's jams, yeah. And so anytime I'd get like a, a broken computer in, I would always dip my toe back in the Linux because like yeah. even even in like the early 2000s, I remember getting like an Ubuntu 8.0 CD or something like that, 8.04 yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And like loading it up and being like, and being just amazed that like there's this free open source software that could yeah. run your computer. Yeah. It was never workable for me in the daily driver sense like i was never smart enough or patient enough to like actually use linux and 
And back in the day, I was still using Photoshop and Illustrator right. and stuff like that. And those things just did not work on Linux, period. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, so you know, I would always dip my toe in. So I get these broken computers and I would, all right, let's see what Linux distros yeah. are up to these days. And it's cool because over the years, I got to see Linux get better and better and better. And to the point where it felt like it was almost like an exponential user experience right. improvement. Where yeah. I'm like, like every year I I dip my toe back into desktop Linux and I'd be like, oh wow, this got a lot better. Like this isn't yeah. just a little bit better than the last time. This is a lot better. Yeah, that's than the super last interesting time. to me because I my experience with Linux was college days, and so they had yeah. Unix in my lab, and that was the later day, basically the tail end of the '90s. And so, and Linux was just coming on the scene and they were serious about Unix uh, at CU Boulder. And so Linux was kind of the new Unix. And I was like, sure. is it going to be good enough? I don't know. We were going to run HPUX and, and, and Sun OS and all those other Unixes. And Linux was this new young thing. Is it going to be good? Um, but of course, everybody switched to Linux. Um, but that was my experience in the early days. And I got yeah. really comfortable with it and the command line interfaces. But in those days, mm -hmm. the window managers were very minimal Chrome and there was a lot of rough edges, right? And and then I kind of, and I was sort of a Windows user at that time. And then I transitioned to Mac about the same time you did when they were transitioning to Intel, which was sort of yeah. mid 2000s or somewhere around then. Yeah. Um, but I haven't touched Linux for a long time other than server side, like all this time I'm doing server side. So I'm totally comfortable mm -hmm. with the, cons the command mode, command line mode, um, but I missed that whole evolution of the desktop experience. And it's been yeah. really fascinating listening to you because now you're transitioned. You've been transitioning into full on developing in Linux. So how has that happened? And what have been the things that have really leveled you up when you've switched over to working with Linux? Well, yeah, and so we talked about this, right? And where it's like, before, back in the old days, it was like, I'd love to use Linux because I love the idea, but it's just too painful. You yeah. know, there's yeah. just too many trade-offs. There's too many, it's gonna take, I don't wanna like, download a Windows driver and wrap it with an open source thing to get it to work. And it's like, eh, I, I don't have time for, for all that. So when when Big Sur trashed my dev environment, <laughs> I and I it was like two days I was working on it. I couldn't get it, I could not get my local Apache PHP app up and running. Yeah. And that sucks. um that sucks. <laughs> you gotta get work just, done. It's like you're like this I, is not what you want to be doing. <laughs> yeah. So so I downloaded Pop OS which is a, a Linux distribution based on um, based on Ubuntu. And and they put a lot of polish on there. There's a lot of like, they really care about that, you know, that distribution. And it's aimed at engineers and developers and it's it's got that angle to it. Yeah. And and I've always been kind of a fan of, of I've been watching them over the years. And being like, wow, I really love what they're doing. And they have, mm -hmm. they're based in Denver and they have a great um, like moral compass. They're big on right to repair and open source and yeah, they nice. really live it. Um, even all their laptop, they sell hardware too. They sell computers yeah. and um, they give you the schematics and how to take it apart and replace things <laughs> down to like the CPU. Like here's how to replace the CPU. Like <sighs> That's so cool. Which is, yeah, which is unheard of these days. So like, yeah. I just, I love them as a company. And their distribution of Linux like reflects that. So out of desperation, I was like, all right, I wonder, like I, I'm so fed up with this with this Mac right now. So I put I put uh Pop OS on a thumb drive, stuck it in my Mac my Intel Mac Mini, yeah. and I installed Pop OS on it. Yeah. And I think like Wi-Fi didn't work because the Intel chip that they use is a little wonky or something, but whatever. It's a Mac Mini, I plugged in the Ethernet. Um, and in 20 minutes, and I, I mean this in all seriousness, in 20 minutes, I had full desktop environment with my VS code, with my PHP, my Apache, yeah. everything. I had my yeah. whole dev environment, my SQL, I had everything running within 20 minutes. Yeah. And it, a light bulb hit me at that moment. And I was like, wow. Yeah. I was like, at this moment in time, Linux is the easier option. <laughs> That's crazy. Than than Mac OS, like yeah. Mac OS is killing me right now. And Linux is just, here you go. Yeah. Here's all your old stuff, just the way you left it. It's yeah. right, yeah. it's all here. <laughs> and um, and there are, you know, and, and again, there, there, there was and there still are kind of like paper cuts. There's certain apps yeah. 
that like I used on Mac that like don't exist on Linux. So like there is a little bit of a learning curve. Sure. Um, I was really big into like the Git, um, was it Tower? There's a program called Tower. It's a Git, you know, GUI interface, right. um, but they don't and they never will in, in their words, make a Linux client. So, yeah. you know, I switched over to Git Kraken, which does, and, and more and more apps are available on on, on Linux now. So there's still a handful of things that you just can't get on Linux right. easily, at least. It's There's a little bit always to switch your grocery store from like the mainstream store to like Trader Joe's. It's like a yeah, just has a different selection of options. You can still get yeah. all the food you want, but it's not the brands you're used to. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. yeah, and so, but anyway, yeah. So that's kind of my story with with, with Linux, and it was just I remember it was just it was, it just blew my mind like how well that represented me, and I realized that like my needs and mac os's what mac os was delivering were aligned for a long time yeah. and then all of a sudden like they kind of went off and i went this way yeah. and realized just how painful it was to be in that tension with like what you're using as as your operating system it's like they're clearly moving away from the way i want to use my computer um, but i still want to use my computer this other way yeah. um, and if there's anything you can say about linux is it is all about user choice and, and I think that's where people get hung up on it and confused with it too, yeah. uh, which I completely understand. Yeah. But that's a bit of my challenge is like, it's just, I don't know. What, I, I want the options selected for me, but there's there is that angle of, if you pick the distro, they will help you pick yeah. your options for you, right? They'll help guide you down yeah. the path. And if your distro is focused for your use case, you're going to have an easy time of it. Like you did with Pop! OS, right? It's like it had yeah. everything you need, right? Right to get you working right away. And mm -hmm. I really like that aspect of the fact that it took you 20 minutes, right? Like literally 20 minutes. Because one of my themes is there's there's a lot of pain in development. And as developers, myself and everybody else I see, we get accustomed to the pain and then we just start ignoring it. We get good at ignoring pain. And yeah. we just live with it. And we just go yeah. throughout our day. We don't even notice it's there when, you know, we spent 10, 20, 30% of our day fighting with our machine rather than working on work. And mm -hmm. sometimes stepping, I mean, you got this chance to get pushed fully out of your, your comfort zone and mm -hmm. to, I got to try something else. And also you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> I was living with all of this pain before and yeah. I was getting in my way of getting work done. And now all of a sudden, like this aligns better with my workflow so I can get stuff done quicker. Yeah. And it, it truly was an existential crisis. I remember telling my wife, Aaron, I was like, I feel homeless. Like, yeah. cause I'm like, <laughs> I have like Mac OS has hurt me in a way now that I don't want to go back to it. It's like a it. bad breakup. <laughs> it is. It truly was a bad breakup. And then on top of that, the M1s came up after we broke out. Right. So you're like, like, oh, oh now, you're, now you're dating someone sexier. Come on. <laughs> right. It's like, ah, oh, why'd you get all hot after we left? You know, like, um, but still, you know, it, it, even with all the M1s, and, and actually my wife has an M1 Air. Uh, yeah. and she roasts me all the time about how she charges it once a month or whatever. And, yeah. you know, good for her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, I, I can't get that taste out of my mouth that like, it's not my choice, yeah. you know? Yeah, for sure. And, and so that's, that's been sticking with me and kind of been my North star through this whole thing. Yeah. Um, and, and then Linux is, is, is a learning journey too, right? You can just throw a pop OS on a, or Ubuntu or Fedora or whatever, yeah. right. And just ride it out forever. Or you could get into it and it can be a, a hobby of sorts as well. And there's a lot of community around it and there's a lot of um, development. Just like I know, you know, you get excited about new node packages and new ways of thinking about doing stuff and like new ways, you know, so there's this, this open source collaborative conversation happening, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, and that's happening in, in the open source Linux world as well, right. where people aren't just saying like, okay, we'll just take whatever Apple or Microsoft gives us and right. we'll build on top of that. You know, there's a whole community of people being like, well, how do we even want to put the system together? Let's right. talk about that. Right. And it's like, whoa, you could, you can, you can be in a conversation at that level. Like that's yeah. so cool. And, yeah, and that's, um, I mean, that's super important, right? Cause certainly, I mean, both, both Windows and Mac have arguably stagnated as OSs, right? They've, they've not yeah. changed much in a decade. And all the effort, at least on Apple's ends, been put into iOS and, and 
iPad OS and all that stuff, right? That's where their focus is on iOS innovation. But, you know, we're the developers that build all these tools that run on all these things. And we're just stuck with this sort of decade old concept of what an OS should be. And mm -hmm. it's really hasn't evolved much past then. And it's, I mean, honestly, I'm still on Mac and I still love it in many ways, but it also feels really stagnant. It feels like yeah, there's a lot of things that are really should be improved to be able to get work done quicker um, mm -hmm. and not be distracted by the OS. Have are there things that pop in your mind when you think about things that Linux is doing that makes the OS, you know, actually fresh and doing something new and that's that's more modern that get and more modern. I mean, modern doesn't really matter if it's not better. That yeah. actually makes life easier using the OS, particularly from a developer perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the biggest thing, and, and this goes for like any distribution, is is there is so much, there, there's so much choice that you can decide, right? Like if you're comfortable with with Windows and that layout where you got a start button and the applications and you got a bar and you know that stuff, like you can go with like something like Linux Mint with the cinnamon desktop they call it, right? Um, if if you like the super old school Linux thing, there's XFCE. That's its own little flavor, right? Yeah. If you're more akin to like the Mac, which I am, I like you know the more minimalist approach where like I don't want to see anything on my screen except for the time yeah. and like my little Telegram notification. Like that's the only thing I want to see yeah. on a blank screen. Um, and then everything else comes from a launcher or something like that. And um, and you can have that with, with Pop! OS or what's called the GNOME desktop. Right. And so you can choose, right? Like you don't have to like be one way or the other. And, and depending on which distro you choose, like Nix OS, which we'll get into, yeah. you can actually switch it. I could, I could this afternoon be in a whole different desktop environment and then switch back to this one. Yeah. And so it's just, it's really cool to be able to have that, like whatever you, whatever you want. Um, the other thing I really like about about Linux is that it is minimalistic by nature. Like, mm -hmm. so when you install it, there's not a whole lot of bells and whistles, right? You build it up to what you want. Now, again, it's up to the distribution to package it enough to make it useful and friendly. Yeah. You know, there are the Arch and Gentoo directions of of Linux where like you are basically building something from scratch, yeah. where like. It, it's going to take you hours to get something useful. Um, <laughs> that is for not for the faint of heart. I don't recommend anybody start there. It's uh, I've done it. Yeah. Uh, I actually have never done Gentoo, but I have done Arch where I've actually built my system brick by brick. Um, but most distributions will give you a great jumping off point, And then it's up to you to add in the bits that you want. So I right. like that. Yeah. My system stays really fast. It stays really minimal. Um, and the stuff that they bring in, like I know, I know Mac OS doesn't have like Windows snapping, right? Like the snapping or tiling, like none of that's like you can buy programs to add no, that on. But, but I do, but it's not built in. It's not built in, and it is on Linux. Like it's just, it, you know, I think pretty much every desktop environment has uh, snapping and tiling that you can that you can turn on if you want to. So yeah, there's just stuff like that where it's just it's really nice, um, yeah. and it's not it's not opinionated either. Uh, one of the things that turned me off about Mac OS was like, I felt like every time I tried to do something, it was like trying to get me to sign it with my Apple ID or yeah. try to get me to get Siri involved. I'm like, I don't know. Just leave me. I just want to, I just want to log into my computer. Like, yeah. you know, I just want a local <laughs> account. What if I don't want an Apple ID? What if I want to have a computer without being tied to some service? Like right, right. you don't have that option uh, with, with Mac and you don't have it with windows now either. Windows is now requiring uh, for Windows 11, I think they're requir requiring you have a Microsoft account to log into your computer, and yeah. I, it just kind of turns <laughs> me off. It's a yeah. it's a little yeah. icky yeah. Um, because there's so much stuff happening in the background too. I noticed this with with Mac OS. One of the things, uh, another thing that I like uh, about Linux uh, versus Mac OS or Windows is that there is a centralized repository and update, you know, uh, system. Right. Uh, and there is a Mac OS, but it doesn't cover your application. So like all your applications have to update themselves. Right. right. Uh, and then Homebrew has to do its own thing. And then Mac right. OS has its own thing. So you, for most developers, you kind of have three different update mechanisms. It's a little ironic given that Apple's the integration 
company yeah. that it's a bit of a Frankenstein when it comes to maintaining, <laughs> updating all your different things, right? It's right. Like you've got all these different parts that are all different and kind of broken in their own different ways. And you got yeah. to kind of deal with all of them in order to keep your, just to keep your system up to date, which is like the basic thing about operating a computer these days. Yeah. And so like I noticed, I know when we were in the RV, so um, we lived in an RV for a little bit, just touring the country for, yeah. for a year. And I remember, and I was a Mac user then, and I remember being, I, I was we were on a like a mobile hotspot, you know, internet plan yeah. and bandwidth, the amount of stuff I downloaded mattered, you know, yeah. so we we're we were trying to stay under that threshold where Verizon would get yeah. mad at us. Yeah. And that was a um, while ago. So there wasn't a, probably wasn't a lot of uh, monthly bandwidth that you had. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a while ago. So um, and, and so I realized when I started metering that and paying attention to that. I realized that like Mac OS, they like, just let apps like kind of download updates in the background. And I was using so much bandwidth to just, when I opened my laptop, it would just start downloading all these like <laughs> gigabytes of, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I didn't, I didn't say yes to any of this. Like yeah. Yeah. Chrome does not need to be updated right now. Let's wait until we get into Wi-Fi somewhere, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, but you don't have that choice where like in Linux, all those updates are, yeah. you turn on, you turn on your Linux machine, not gonna auto update anything, like yeah. unless so, you say, tell me, "Go for it." Tell me what distro are you running right? What do you want right now? And, and yeah. also, we're gonna talk about NixOS. Yeah. Well, I'm running NixOS right now. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I I I knew you were like doing that, and you still have Pop OS and so forth. So I didn't know if you're okay. running uh, NixOS as your daily driver, but that's super cool. Yeah. So again, uh, I am. You don't need to do this, right? Like anyone can just use Linux. And oh, and yeah. a, a quick shout out too. Um, an important part of my story was one of my fears when I jumped to Linux full time, when I left Mac and went to Linux, it was scary because I was like, am I losing all the support? Right. There's this idea because traditionally to use Linux, you need to buy a Windows laptop and then wipe it off, void your warranty and put Linux on it. Right. I right. right. hope everything works. Right. Uh, and no one's going to help you with it. You know, <laughs> you're just going to be on forums asking for help. Yeah. So that was really scary for me because I was like, oh my God, like, am I, is this foolish? Am I going off in a irresponsible right, direction? Right. I totally remember. That's exactly what it felt like around the year 2000. That, that you were just jumping in the deep end and yeah. you, you were on your own. And yeah, you, there you like, good luck. And there's enthusiastic people and people want to help you out there, but you know, you got to go find the people that's actually going to be helpful. It, yeah, it, it's definitely going out right. in the wilderness. When you're using it as a daily driver and a work machine, yeah. you don't have time. Like, it's fine if it's a side toy. Yep. But like when you're relying on it to get your work done, you need to have, you need to feel supported. And so that company, System76 that I was telling you about, they sell Linux first hardware and they have lifetime support of that device. And you can ask them about, you can ask them anything about software, hardware. Um, and so, so cool. I bought, I bought a computer from them. I bought several computers from them yeah. now. Um, yeah, and I think and a lot do. of non Linux users, like Mac and Windows users, don't realize that that's that's the world we're in now. Like you can get like legit full yeah. support on Linux from people who know what they're doing. They're enthusiastic. They're helpful. Yeah. I mean, you've interacted with these people a few times. I know I, you told me the stories, and they're just so great. Yeah, no, the, the, they're they're amazing. They're amazing. Yeah. And and again, um, and it's just so nice to have to reach out to support. You know, and it's like, oh, they're in Denver, Colorado. They are real people. They understand. Like I've asked some dumb questions too. Yeah. I know when I was first getting started with Linux, like, oh my God, how do I do this? And like, they always help you, even if it's not something that they did, but they'll help you with, with Linux. And I think that's important because it's like, you're not on your own. I think that's an old story that doesn't need to be true. Hell, yeah. even I have a Dell Precision laptop and I bought it with Ubuntu on it. Now I didn't yeah. keep Ubuntu on it, but that means that Dell supports Linux on there officially yeah. and Lenovo's you can buy with Linux on there too. Yeah. And that means, and that's important because that means that if they're going to sell you the laptop with Linux on it, it means that they support Linux. They yeah. might not answer all of your esoteric yeah. questions about <laughs> software, right? But it does guarantee that Linux will work on that. All your stuff will work. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's a stamp of approval that like old school Linux users never had. Yeah, yeah. that's super <laughs> you, cool. You always had to do your due diligence, right. but now you can literally just say, hey, you know, and it's also cheaper because you don't buy the Windows license. Right, right. 
Yeah, and you know, maybe. Apple's not cheap, so <laughs> that's awesome. Right, right, yeah. So, so uh, yeah. one of the things that uh, we wanted to yeah. get to, because you've recently done this article on NixOS that just got a lot of interest yeah. on Medium, and we'll put a link to it. Uh, but I'm super excited about NixOS because I've long been thinking about how do we. I, I'm, I am the modular guy. I want to isolate things and encapsulate them and protect them mm -hmm. as much from everything else. And I want that capability at all levels of software. I want to be able to isolate every little bit as much as possible to give, mm -hmm. I believe modularization gives you leverage. And NixOS has a really interesting take on this. So explain what NixOS is and what's their unique angle. Yeah, so like I was saying, what's cool about Linux is that it, it, there's a lot of talk about like, oh, how do we even put the system together? Let's go back to basics. So, um, most operating systems, right? You install it, you have your files there. They're just a bunch of packages. There's a package manager that's in charge of like making sure dependencies are resolved and making sure everything's okay. Right. Um, and then as you use your computer, you install stuff, you remove stuff, you change stuff or whatever, things get messy. I mean, we all know that like from yeah. the old Windows days where like every year you'd have to just reinstall Windows yeah, yeah. because there was so much <laughs> junk built up. Um, and so, you know, that's a problem, right? And so one of the ways, and it's a hard problem to solve because it's like, okay, well, yeah, you have this like malleable system that you're poking into and pulling stuff out of. Trying and pulling wires all around and connecting. Yeah, like around. how do you keep that clean, right? And one of the ways that you can keep that clean is uh, an immutable operating system. And this is what your iPhone has, your iPad, uh, Android phones, um, and Chromebooks, right? Find me a Chromebook that won't boot up and just do what it needs to do. Right. Um, you, you can't unless it's physically damaged or something, right. but the software is always okay. Yeah. And really ham-fisted novice users use these things, right? Like how do they stay, they give them the kids to yeah. take to school, right? Like how are they not breaking these things, right? With, with software. And the reason they're not breaking them is because they're immutable, which means you can't write to them. Yeah. So you download, you know, so when you when you update your iPhone or try to update your iPhone, right? It'll either work or not work. Right. And it downloads a big old image. And then once the whole image is down, it swaps it out for the old image and boots up to that. And then all your applications are little containers that just get put on top of it. Yeah. And so you just swap out the base, put on your apps on top and voila, you have a little operating system Sunday there, right? <laughs> nice. And and that works great. It works so great that like, yeah. again, you, you just, you'll never find a broken iPhone like yeah. that won't boot up. And again, unless it's physically damaged, but like right. an update never goes sideways on you and you end up with a broken system, right? Same thing with Chrome OS. And the cool thing about Chrome OS too, that's why you can power wash Chrome OS devices. So a Chromebook, if you want to give it to somebody, you don't have to reformat it. You can just go in there and say power wash and what it does is it keeps the immutable image and just wipes out all of your stuff that was on top of it. Right, and right. voila, now you, have just a, done. now you have a fresh computer again. Yeah. So it's a great idea. And the, you know, Linux was like, well, how do we get that in a desktop, in a, in a desktop distribution? Right, right. Um, and there's a couple different ways to do it. So the, the, the most, probably the most famous one is Fedora has their project Silver Blue. Mm -hmm. And so what Fedora did is they said, hey, let's take this exact idea and do it for a Linux distribution, right? Yeah. And so it's the same idea where like you download an update, it's one big update that comes in, they swap out your old image. Um, and then in theory too, you can like roll back, like even if you don't like the new image or something went wrong, you can boot back into the old one, but all your stuff still stays on top. Right, right. And it's a great idea and it is a bulletproof system. The problem is the use case for a computer yeah. is a little different than a phone or a Chromebook, right? right. Uh, phones and Chromebooks can get away with that because they have a very limited use case. You're not running dev tools on your phone. Right. Uh, you're, you don't, you're not in terminals in your phone. Like, you know, you're not running MySQL on your phone. So like you don't need these system level applications. So it's easy to do the whole image swap out. Well, on a desktop distribution, it's not so easy, right? So how do you do that? And so uh, Fedora's approach was to like, all right, we'll cook in all the basics that we think you'll need and a couple of escape hatches and we'll do it like that. The problem with it is that like, if you want to say run Docker Compose or Docker or whatever, yeah. right? You have to go inside of a container, which gives you a little mutable Fedora install and then you work <laughs> inside of that. So you got your, immutable inside your immutable. Yeah. You a little special little world where you're allowed to mutate things. It's again. containers all the way down, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, 
And I like containers just fine, but I don't want to live in them all the time. I, I really gave Fedora a good uh, silver blue, a good shake because yeah. I like the bulletproof aspect of it. But it felt like I was at my grandma's house where the couch is wrapped in plastic, right? <laughs> yeah. It keeps the couch safe. That's true. It's a couch is nice underneath it's not of very there. Comfortable. <laughs> it's not very comfortable. Nobody wants to sit on it, right? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> so what's the point? Um, so that's what I found with Fedora Silver Blue. So it was frustrating. I was like, all right, I like the idea, but this isn't working. Yeah. And then on a podcast, I heard about NixOS. Yeah. NixOS is clever because what they do is they say, okay, we see the problem here. Um, what if you could dictate in a config file what's inside that immutable image? Right. Let's keep the unbreakable image model. That's cool. We like yeah. that. Yeah. But what if you could build that yourself? Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. you will have different stuff in your immutable image than i will have like there's no one size fits all immutable image and so that's what nixos does so there's a config file um that has literally a list of like here's what i want in my host file here's what i here's the software packages i want i want docker i want docker compose i want a node a npm like you can like list out all the stuff that you want in your computer yeah. save that config file and then run nixos build and what it does is it will compile that. And the cool thing is it'll check to make sure that like, okay, everything's gonna play nicely together. Like it does a sanity check of all this stuff, yeah. it builds that immutable image, drops it on there, and then you reboot and voila. Now yeah. all of that stuff is in there yeah. and uh, in, this Im in, in this immutable chunk. So it's like, you don't have to worry about, oh, how do I get Docker Compose on this thing? It's already in there. Yeah. You can't mess with it now, right? You still can't break it, yeah. um, but that's in there. And then all your applications, all your user applications, like, um, I don't know, like the VS Code or Git Kraken or Spotify yeah. Stuff or that Zoom. doesn't need system level access. Right, so we're on Zoom right now, right? Uh, yeah. We're on Zoom right now, and this is on NixOS. Uh, this is not in my base immutable image. This is a right. flat pack, which is a little containerized application, just like your phone apps. Right. that sits on top of it right and so that's fine it doesn't yeah. need to touch i don't need it to have system level access but like i want docker compose yeah. to be in my system i want explain, to be able to go to any folder and just type docker compose up <laughs> and explain have flat pack really quick for the people who don't know what flat pack is yeah so flat pack is just a way to package linux applications um in so it has a, it's basically a little containerized you know application so it works right. just like the apps apps on your phone basically yeah. uh, and they come with their own run times so um so like and and they share run times too right so like there's a whole flat pack ecosystem right. um and it's a way the cool thing is back in the old days of linux you used to have to worry about like what distro you were running because you wanted a certain version of a certain software like right. oh i want to run ubuntu but like they don't have x software they, right. they don't have spotify in in their in their repos or whatever right. um because it's proprietary and they can't have that right like yeah. so and there was no universal way to like have apps on whatever different you know software right. so now there's something called flatpak which flatpak is a service that runs on your computer mm -hmm. and has these runtimes that it can like libraries basically right um and so you can install like the flat pack I have for Zoom here is the same one that somebody else would have on their Fedora machine, which is mm -hmm. the same that somebody would have on their Ubuntu machine or whatever. Like it doesn't matter. That's really um, cool. So I, did, I didn't realize, I mean, we've talked about flat pack, but I didn't realize that it solves that problem of cross distro compatibility. That's yep, really yep. cool. Yes. And it's up to date. So you don't need to worry about like, oh, well, this version, you know, this distro uh, is more conservative, so they're not as up to date, you know, right, right. because <laughs> people need that problem. Yeah, because there are people that need to maintain these packages too, right? Yeah, so yeah. it's like, you know, um, it, do we do we need how many distros of Linux are there, right? Do we yeah. need like that many people uh, maintaining Spotify or Gitcrack yeah. or what? Yeah. Any no, and, so, and you don't want to. I mean, that's just there's a whole trust aspect there too. Like like if you switch between distros and other things, like how do you know? I mean. You assume that the trust is there, but yes, you, having to spend that time building up trust with all these different sources of packages and so forth, it's yeah. just a big mess. So that's another yeah. way that the Linux ecosystem is really leveling up their game. Yeah, yeah, and again, they, they really are embracing this this containerized um, you know way of, of doing applications too. So yeah. uh, all flat pack applications are sandboxed too, right. um, and you can tweak the permissions on them. So like, 
Zoom can only look at like my home downloads directory or whatever, but I can go into settings. I can say, ah, I want Zoom to go into these other folders. I don't right. Right. start Zoom, <laughs> but no. Um, yeah. Yeah. But but you can tweak that kind of stuff, which I think is really cool. Um, so back so, on, yeah. Nix, on Nix OS. So what? So first of all, the obvious question is, what happens if you build your your kernel, which I guess they don't call it a kernel. I, what do they call the the pack that you built of all your things for Nix OS? Do they have a name for that? I guess it's just an image, right? Yeah, it's like image. a a snapshot, an image, if you will. So if you yeah. build an image that worst case fails to boot, which seems highly yeah. unlikely, but if it breaks, like what's, how does that, how do you handle that? Yeah, so um, yeah, NixOS has a lot of safety features in there too. Uh, one of the things I love about uh, NixOS is how it builds these images is there's a folder on your computer called like NixOS store. Yeah. And so like when you update, right? Cause you can run updates too. And it, so it downloads like the new versions of them they're all in folders separate. So like if you have, um, you know, let's use Docker Compose, yep. Docker Compose 2.3, and then let's say like 2.5 is in your new build or whatever, and 2.5 doesn't work. Well, guess what? 2.3 is still in your system. Yeah. It's just, it's just, you're not using it. You're not pointing to it, you're right? right? So when you say Docker Compose, it points to this other one. So the cool thing is every time you rebuild your system in XOS, every time you run an update, every time you decide to add software or whatever, yeah. it saves your old config yeah. and it's in your grub, your boot menu. Right. So like right. if you type, you know, let's say everything's fine here and I type, you know, I'm like, oh, I want to add this thing and I add it and I do an update to and I get a new Linux kernel and I yeah. get a new GNOME package or whatever. Um, it downloads all that, right? And then I reboot and I reboot into into the new image. And what yeah. it, what you're right, what if something's broken? What if like, yeah. oh, the new kernel doesn't play well with my NVIDIA graphics card right, or right, right. whatever, something, right? You can reboot and then in that boot menu, yeah. you have all the previous generations that you've done. So you just yeah. go to the one before, yeah. press enter, and you're in the system as it was before you even did the update. Yeah. yeah. So. And what's cool is again, it's only addressing that immutable image. Yeah. So let's say let's say you do an update, you boot into the new update, right. and you start doing work. Right. So you right. start editing code, you start doing work, and then you realize, oh God, I don't like this new thing. I want to go back. Yeah. Well, if you're dealing with snapshots, you're gonna lose all the work you just did. Right, right. But in NixOS, you don't because you're just swapping out that immutable base. Right. But right. all your files still get put on top of right. this of the Sunday. That's so cool. Right? That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. So it it's 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 unbreakable. And Shane, the coolest thing that I really like is I like mess I like tweaking around. I like messing around, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um and in theory, right? So I talked about how like there's all these different desktop environments in Linux and they're always being developed all the time. So it's really exciting. Yeah. Um and again you don't have to dig into that. You just pick one and go with it you know, if right. you're a sane person. But if you're insane <laughs> like me, um it's fun to kind of peek around and you're like, oh, what are, what are they doing over there? Well, right. I want to see what the new cinnamon is like, right? right. Um, in a traditional system, when you install a new desktop environment, it comes with all these dependencies. So you pull all these things down and you end up with like a bit of a mess. Like you can, in theory, install multiple desktop environments in a system. Yeah, but. <laughs> but, it, but it makes a mess. And then good luck trying to pull one of them back out, right? right, right. And you're like, oh, I just wanted to try. I don't really want to stay with it. Well, now you have all these weird dependencies hanging around and stuff like that. Yeah. The cool thing about NixOS is that in the config file, you say, hey, I want to use this desktop environment. And it builds it from the ground up. So if you say, all right, I want to try, let me go into my config file. I want to try Cinnamon, right? And yeah. you swap that out. It's just one line. <laughs> um, you switch that out in one line and you rebuild it. Well, guess what? It rebuilds it from the ground up without your old one and with your right, your new right. one. So it's like, you know, you always people always like are concerned, like, oh, if I remove something, have I fully removed it? Right, right. Like, how, how are you and, sure you're fully? Am I gonna have weird conflicts down the road because of some some janky thing yes. between the transition? Right, because it's impossible that it's impossible for the package manager to maintain all of that. Yeah. Insanity. And no so, one can test all those combinations of, oh, you had installed that, now you switched to this. Like, right. no one's testing that. No, no one's testing to see if that works. Hopefully it does, right. fingers crossed. <laughs> it's just too complicated, right? Yeah. And so what NixOS says is like, well, let's let's opt out of the whole game. Yeah. We'll just rebuild your system. It's like a Docker, it's like a Docker Compose rebuild, right? Where yeah. it's like, 
Who cares what you your OS. Yeah, right. Who cares awesome. what you used to have in there? Let's yeah. just build it up fresh. Yeah. So like if you have all the stuff in there and then you for a client and then like that contract ends and well now you don't need all this stuff. I don't need yeah. Ruby and all this stuff anymore. Well, right. I can just remove that from my config file, rebuild it, and now it's like Ruby never existed on my system. Right. There's right. no trace of it because it just got built clean. And you've got the history of your previous images, so you can jump yeah. between them, you can go back, you can go forward. Yeah. You're like, oh, I like that cinnamon. I'm going to go try it again today. Yeah. Literally just, you can decide that on a whim, and in 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you're back up and yeah. running. You're in cinnamon. You're like, this is cool. I'll use this for a little while. I'm like, oh, man, no, this sucks. I'm switching back. You're like, it's right. not a big thing. Yeah, and, you know, messing around the side, the, the point here is that it is bulletproof. You will always, always, even I, I got into something where, I was messing around my config. I removed some stuff I shouldn't have removed. Yeah. And sure enough, when I booted up, I like got to a terminal screen. I didn't get to a, a GUI. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. but, like, but again, I was like, oh no, this is my work machine. And there was this moment of panic of like, oh boy, I broke it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, oh wait, I'll just reboot. And I rebooted into my last known config and everything was there, Yeah. yeah. got my work done. And then I went into the config. I'm like, oh yeah, I shouldn't have removed that. Whoops. Yeah. Um, and then it was done. So, there's this durability bulletproof aspect that I think is important to everyone, but I think it's especially important for developers. Right. Um, and then also, you know, what I like is that in, in NixOS, you can choose what version of certain software. Like I can, in my config, I can say I want PHP 7.4 or a right. set or Right. Just like you would Docker. Just like with the Docker, right? You could choose yeah. exactly the right configuration software. Yeah, and if you've got two different clients, you don't have to have these weird uh, install managers for each different language. Of course, each language yeah. has their own install manager, so you can install multiple different versions, and they all work differently, and they're all very leaky abstractions. That's all gone. Like, you don't have to worry about yeah. any of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. So it's, so it's super powerful. And again, you always have that, you know, you always have that escape hatch. Uh, the, the other kind of benefit um, is that, let's say your computer blows up. You know, or you lose it, or it gets stepped on by a six-year-old that's running around <laughs> with a candy cane. I don't yeah. know anything about this. These are just, just esoteric just examples. Just hypotheticals. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, right? <laughs> what if something happens, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Now you're now you got to worry about like you know you're back. Hopefully, all your work is saved in Git or whatever. Right. But but even if you went and bought a new computer. How long is that going to take you now to set up all your right. stuff? Like, right. I mean, it's a day, you know, like it's yeah. it's hours of stuff. Well, the cool thing about NixOS is I can get a new computer today yeah. and I can drop my NixOS config that I have because I have it saved and get has yeah. it describes my whole system. Yeah. So I just drop that on the new computer, type rebuild, grab a coffee, and in five minutes I come back and all my stuff's there. I yeah. may have to yeah. change notification settings or like little local stuff, but all of my tools are there. It's not like I type Docker Compose and it's like Docker Compose not found. Like, oh, right, damn it, I gotta install that. Like yeah. that doesn't exist anymore for me. I have a file, I literally have one file. I have a NixOS config dot file yeah. that has my whole system in there. Yeah. And I never have to worry about it again. Like <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, saw I, it once and it's good. Yeah, I, I love that, just that aspect of, um, you know, when you're, when you're upgrading, like I, you know, I'm a Mac and so I get, I follow the updates each year. Right. And I, I, I like to be on the cutting edge. It's what I like to do for sure. But I do wait a little bit once it comes out, like for about a month, like yeah. I like hold my hands behind my back. I'm going to wait just a little bit for them to kick the tires a little bit on this thing. And then I always have this thought. I was also the thought when I upgraded my iPhone, should I start fresh or should I let Apple my <laughs> Which yeah. one am I going to do this time? Because sometimes, mm -hmm. like, I want to get it all clean, but sometimes, like, I just want to get to work. I like my configuration. I have to rebuild it. Here, you yeah. got you got the best of both worlds, right? You're getting mm -hmm. a clean build every time, and it can be just the things you want. And mm -hmm. you can yank things out, add things in, and then get another clean build on it. And so you get that fresh, clean build, and you also get to be able to configure it and update it, um, you know, with the latest, greatest, or or the not the latest, greatest, as, as you need. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the that's the the final thing I'll say about the the, the power of NixOS too is that it's just a great project and it's been around for a long time too. It's been around since I think two thousand seven or something. It's been around for a while. Yeah. Um, and it's a standalone package manager. So you can actually install Nix as oh, really? a package manager on your Mac or Windows cool. too. Hey, you won't get all the OS benefits of it, but like yeah. you can still, you know, it it. 
some people are using it as a Docker replacement, um, a, a lighter weight Docker replacement because you can install just the things that you want. Um, but I, I don't know much about that to be honest with That's you because I'm using it. Yeah, I'm using it. I'm using it. So if you go to if you go to the Nix website, you'll see there's Nix as a package manager, but then there's Nix OS, which right. is like the whole Linux distribution. Right, so, right. Yeah. Um, but they're very they're very related. Uh, the other cool thing, real quick, about because you were talking about updates, right? And one of the things that I've always hated with Windows, Mac, and Linux are big version updates, right? Yeah. Where it's like, oh God, here comes Ventura. What am I going to lose? Like, yeah, yeah. because the delta between the two are so big. Yeah. And I think as developers, we understand that, like, whenever you have a, you know, whenever yeah. I do a Git merge for yeah. a big branch, I'm always like, Sweet baby Jesus, here we go. Yeah. That's one of the reasons I recommend, like if you're developing in any system with that package manager as a software developer, the best thing to do is just keep updating your packages um, on the monthly or something. Because if you wait yeah. a year and you have to yeah. do that update, like 10 of them are gonna have breaking changes. And Lord knows what's gonna happen if you turn, let them all come in all at once. You're just gonna have yeah. an explosive complication of, of, of miss, miss stuff that's not gonna work with your software. Versus if you do it on the regular, little incremental updates, you know, occasionally you might have a break, but you know exactly what it was. Oh, that's the one package that updated. Yes. Um, I know exactly, they're I'm small. gonna look into that one. Yeah. 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 So get this, Shane, I don't even think you know about this, yeah. but there's uh, the idea of Nix, right? They have a, something called channels. Yeah. So there's Nix OS channels, which is like, what do you want to tune into, right? So you have your config file that says Docker Compose, right? Yeah, yeah. But you're not saying what version of Docker, you're just saying, I, here's the stuff I want in my computer, right? Right, right. The versions of those things that you'll get will depend on which Nix channel that you're okay. tuned to. Okay. So there's a stable channel, which updates every six months. Mm -hmm. So we're, we currently, Nix just released um, 22.11, which is... Yeah. Not surprisingly, the year 2022, right, right. November. Right? I like version schemes like that. It's obvious what you're doing. <laughs> it's very obvious, right? Yeah. And so, and the next one will be 23.05, right? Like, yeah. and so the cool thing is like, when you're, you're when you install Nix, you're, you're on the stable channel and you're what, whatever the latest stable channel is, and you're tuned into there and you can stay there as long as you want. Right. Even after the new one gets out, we'll still, I think, backport security fixes for like a year or something like that, right? You don't have to switch to the new one yet, but right. you can. The other option is, but you now you're in the same problem where it's like, well, now you're downloading six months of updates basically at once, right? Right, right, right. Um, Nix OS has what they call an unstable channel, mm -hmm. which- <laughs> Stable, unstable. Which is a little, yeah, it's a little bit of a misnomer because I have found it very stable. Right. Anyway, what the unstable channel is, it's a rolling release. Mm -hmm. So there are no point versions. Yeah. You just update and they just say, all right, here's all my newest stuff, boom. Yeah. And then next week I run update, oh, here's all your newest stuff, boom. Right. So like NixOS just did, you know, the big update to like 22.11. Yeah. I I updated my, and everything's, you know, like nothing yeah. radically changed yeah. because I am on the rolling release cycle. So, right. um, and that's cool that you can do that in the config file, you can say, you can say, hey, I want, you know, uh, I feel a little squidgy about being on the cutting edge. Like, I don't, you know, yeah. I, I want things to be super safe. I don't want anything to change on me, you know, for six months. I don't want to, yeah. I don't yeah. I don't want anything to change except for security updates or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's your choice. But you can also say, you know what? I don't like these big upgrades. I just always want the freshest stuff. Yeah. Just give me, just give me the freshest stuff all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's what channel that I'm tuned in on right now. Now, yeah. the cool thing is, you know, there are a lot of Linux distributions that are rolling releases like Arch and there's, there's you know, Arch is the most notable one, right? right? And, you know, Arch is the whole move fast, break things, you know, kind of uh, mentality, mm -hmm. which is fun, but it's also a little <laughs> scary. Right, it's if a you little... get work done again, that might be problematic sometimes. Yeah, hey, yeah, you do an Arch update and you're like, ah, crap, like my bootloader updated wrong. Hey, you know, there's ah. something, <laughs> something went, it was something went terribly sideways. And yeah. unless you have really good backups, um, you're you're rebuilding your system or you're, yeah. you got a little work ahead of you. Um, what's cool about NixOS, like I'm currently tuned into the unstable channel. So I just get the newest kernel, I get the newest, stuff all the time, everything's been working great. Yeah. But if it doesn't, yeah. if at some point unstable becomes unstable for me, yeah. I don't have to rebuild my system. All I have to do is go into the next channel and say, 
ah, you know what? I'm done with this rolling lifestyle. Yeah. Put, put me back, put me back on the stable, right. rebuild it. It says, okay, downloads, whatever packages you want for that reboots. Now you're stable. And of I've course, as never... you said earlier, right? You can lock in the versions of specific things too. Like, oh, but yeah. I want to have PHP, this yeah. 2.7 specifically. Yes, yes, yeah, you can do that. But like things like, you know, uh, your desktop environment, right? Like, right, right. Just keep me updated. You know, I'm on GNOME 43.015. I don't know. You know, I yeah. don't know what version it is, right? Yeah. <laughs> but there, but there's with any software, there's I want super cutting edge and fresh, or I want to be super conservative and I just want to stick with like super stable. It might be a little boring. It might not have the new bells and whistles, right. but it's stable. And I'll wait until the next milestone of stable to, to update that, right? Definitely. And that's your choice. And I've never met an operating system. Linux or otherwise, yeah. that lets you switch between the two as you want. Yeah. Usually you have to decide like, am I gonna be a rolling release guy or am I gonna be yeah. a stable, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. Well, um, so you choose Ubuntu because it's got the stable, the big stable release. Yeah, it's got right? the stable exactly. thing, right? And then, yeah. you know, in, in two years when the next LTS comes yeah. out, you know, like n now you're in for a world of pain. And but you realize you know, on people, Ubuntu that your packages are ancient. And like, it's like nothing, don't work with anything until you do a manual install anyway. Yeah, I had that experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that is a way, right? So, you know, a lot of people like Ubuntu because it's old and boring. Yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong and with that. More again, power, more power. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, it's, you know, that's the thing about Linux. It's choice, right? So that is your choice. If you want to, if you want to go old and boring, you can. If you want to go fresh and, uh, you know, new and fresh and cutting edge, you can too. Um, and again, the great part about NixOS and the reason I wrote the article and the reason I'm so fired up about it is because it is the only thing I've seen. I think it's the freshest take. I think it's the hottest take on how to put together an operating system. Yeah. It, feels like the future. Um, I have never felt so confident in my computer being able to be what I need it to be. Yeah. I've yeah. never felt as confident as I do so with, cool. with NixOS. And it's yeah. been it's been months I've been running it. And I think it's in summer. So actually more. So we're going on like half a year now. Of, yeah. And usually I can break a Linux, you know, thing by poking <laughs> around. I can break yeah. stuff pretty pretty easily if I yeah. if I want to. Um, so you uh, and, so you wrote this article and it's definitely got yeah. some cool traction. Have you gotten any cool any feedback from it? What what's sort of been your, your response from the community on it? Well, yeah, I mean, so there's there's two types of the, you know the community. There's the Linux community, which already very much knows about this, right? And there's the bees out there, like the are Linux curious. <laughs> yeah, that are Linux curious. Yeah, and um, yeah, I mean, the feedback has been phenomenal. Um, it, and again, I think there's just when you're in a hobby or when you're in, you know, when you're, when you're in something like you're really into Tesla and like, and all the technology goes back and, you know, into that, but like, you would have to explain things a little more high level for me, like zoom out a little bit and be like, right. what, you know, like yeah. it, when you're in, when you, when you're heavily involved in something, it's easy to look at the like little details and forget to zoom out. Yeah. Um, and so the article was cool because it, it was, I think people really resonated with the fact that like, it was a way to kind of zoom out and like, not just talk about like nitty gritty, like, oh, this is why NixOS is great. Cause there's always distro wars happening sure, and people sure. judging other people for what distros <laughs> they choose and stuff like that. Humans will be humans. <laughs> humans will be humans. I don't have time for that, but it was just like, yeah. this is why I think this is cool. Huh. Here's how it works. And, you know, and, and, and I don't know exactly how NixOS works. Like you know, there's, yeah. there's a whole bunch of You're magic. You're not OS engineer. Happens. That's sort of the point. You don't want to be an OS yeah, engineer. When I type NixOS rebuild, like I don't, there, it does, the terminal fills up with all kinds of stuff. I don't know all of it. You know, yeah. there's a black box of magic in there for me. I could figure it out. It's open source, no. but I don't feel like it. Why would you? You got other things to do. Why would I? I, I got PHP to write, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, anyway, so uh, that's what's been really cool is that, you know, it's really, and I think it's the conversation, whether it's NixOS, I'm in love with NixOS. I think it's great. It's on all of my systems. Yeah. And the great part is I even put it on my kid's laptop. I put it on my dad's computer because yeah. um, I don't have to worry about them breaking it. Right. Yeah. Like, right, right. They can't break it. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's impossible. They can't break it. I mean, they can physically break it. But like my dad is king of doing updates and installing stuff where I'm like, why'd you do that? Why'd you click on that? You know, Um <laughs> And that just won't be, that will never be a problem with, with Nix. When I go visit him, 
I'll do an update <laughs> in the yeah. terminal and <laughs> and make sure that it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I think you know that's that's the real benefit here. But I think there's a bigger conversation of like, this is a great idea on how to put a system together. Right. So whether it's NixOS or whatever, I could totally see macOS adopting something like this or even Windows. It's what they do on like, iOS, but they've been really slow to adopt it on macOS. I think they're just ignoring macOS. I don't know. I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah. MacOS is certain. I mean, yeah, whatever. I, I'm not a <laughs> macOS expert, but I mean, I will say that when I use, it's very odd, right? I've been using Linux full-time now everywhere for over two years, which still blows my mind. Right. Um, going from Linux curious to, I haven't touched another, I haven't used another computer that hasn't been on Linux uh, for two years. And uh, when I occasionally go into my my wife's MacBook Air, um, Mac OS feels old to me now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but just it, I, I'm like, oh, this is and kind it's of- It's the pain is... that I'm used to, right? Like I'm used to it, it yeah. works fine for me. I've not yep. had that experience where the, the OS breaks on me. But if I did, yeah. I would easily feel myself going on the same path. Like I, I got to get work done. I got to do other things. Right. I can't be messing around with this. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it's just weird that um you know, and that's a human thing too, right? Where it's like what you're used to. Yeah. Um, and I always it's always amazing to me because like Mac was my comfortable home for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I think it, I still shocks me when I open up her MacBook Air and I'm like, this is awkward. Um, and I'm like, oh my god, for 15 years this was home. Yeah. And and Linux was awkward, cool, but awkward. Um, and now it's very much turned a corner where it's like, oh, yeah, I can't imagine. I get annoyed uh, using anything other than Linux now because um, I'm like, why can't I turn this off? Like, this is, ah. <laughs> I get so, so frustrated. So, so yeah. switching to sort of in conclusion, um, do you yeah. have any sort of last words you might want to say to a uh, Linux, excuse me, to a, a, a Mac or a Windows user who might be interested in trying out Linux um, who might be interested in just dabbling all over there? Like, like, where where do you start? Where's where's a good place to try things out and and land? Particularly if you're a developer, land on your feet and be able yeah. to get something going. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the biggest thing is to first know that Linux desktop Linux is a an actual serious uh, option for you. Yeah. And I think you know for the longest time, uh, Linux was for weird old guys with beards. Yeah. Uh, you know with freedom fighter stickers on their cars or whatever. Like, and it, it's an old story, right? And they, that still exists, right? I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but like, um, that's not everybody. And so I, I think that if you haven't used desktop Linux, if you haven't tried it recently, you'll be surprised. You, you will be surprised how smooth it is. I, I know I was, and I still am sometimes. I'm like, God damn, this is so like, so everything just works. Like I, I'm blown away. Like I never thought I'd say that. I truly never thought I would say Linux is the easiest option and everything just works out of the box. Like <laughs> they're still they're stealing Mac's brand, man. <laughs> I, I know they, they they truly are. Um, so yeah, you 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 know download something like Pop OS or something like that or Linux Mint. Uh, they're the two distros that I think are the best for beginners. Yeah. Um, uh, Linux Mint and Pop OS. And the cool thing about both of them is they have a live version. So you can you can download ISO image and flash it to a USB thumb drive, um, stick it into anything, you know, obviously not a Mac, unless it's an <laughs> Intel Mac, you can still do it in the Intel Macs. Yeah. Um, but stick it into any kind of machine that can boot to that USB drive. Uh, and then you get dropped into a live environment mm -hmm. where everything's there. Yeah. Your hardware works. You can even install stuff. So you can poke around and, and see what that's like. And and I think you'll be amazed by like how smooth that experience is. And you can do all that without affecting your system. Right. So you can still keep Windows or Mac or whatever on there. And you can play yeah. around on the live version. It's not as fast, obviously, because you're on off the USB, USB stick. Right? Yeah, you're on the yeah. USB stick, right? So, But you can try it um, out without having to commit, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. You know, and but just to understand that it's an actual, I, I see people get frustrated with Mac OS and homebrew and stuff like that, right? And and they and they get frustrated and they're like, ah, but I don't want to go to Windows. Like, I still hate Windows. I'm like, there is a third option. Like, it, and it's, <laughs> yeah. and again, it, it's kind of a new serious option. I, I will say that like five years ago, the conversation would have been way different. It would have been like, well, if you're brave, and you yeah. want to put in the time, you could, you could, the learning curve steep, but you can figure it out, yeah. you know, 
I don't think that's the case anymore. I think yeah. you can have a handful of things that you learn and they're easy things. Like again, knowing that you can install stuff through Flatpak and uh, right. distros like Linux Mint and uh, Pop! OS have Flatpak already installed by default. Yeah. And you just open the software center and you type in Zoom and there's Zoom. You type in VS Code, there's VS Code. Like literally everything's there like in a centralized store that you just download. So again, in a lot of ways, it's a heck of a lot easier um, than dealing with that. And both Linux Mint and Pop! OS are based on Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. So any, you know, a lot of times you'll search the internet and you'll be like, oh, how to install Docker, right? right? Or how to install whatever. Um, anything that, set, that works for Ubuntu will work for, right. you know, um, so you kind of, understanding that they're based on that so yeah. yeah again there's some little there's some little things that like you kind of like need to know just like you know we were talking like i remember the first time i used mac os i didn't understand the doc I'm like what is this thing on the body you know like yeah. that's weird um and then you get used to it and you're like oh all right i get i get it now yeah. um well, so that's there's cool. things, that's, things like, like that. That's yeah. pretty addressable uh, to get started with. Now, I do remember way back in the days when you had boot CDs, right? I, that, that's what I dabbled with in the early 2000s was you, boot, yeah. you, you burn a disc and you could boot off of it, try it without swapping your system. But it sounds like with a stick, like you can install things, you can do work with it. So that's cool. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for this tour today, Mike. I think that uh, myself and a lot of other sort of uh, Mac or Windows developers have uh, need to update our images of what we think Linux can be um, in terms of an actual you know, plug and play operating system. Um, that lets us get our work done, which is, you know, you're actually tempting me. You know, I do have, I have an, an Intel uh, Mac sitting over here that uh, it, ha it has the, the butterfly keyboard, but I, I can, I can plug an external keyboard into it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, we've been talking about this for a while, but I'm very tempted to try this stuff out, particularly Nix, uh, NixOS, because that just, I love the modularity of that. That's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, and NixOS is good. I mean, I don't want to dissuade anyone. I know I was talking about how, for beginners, you know, um, you know, but I, I, for Pop! OS and, and Linux Mint are are really good. They're just really good out of the box experiences. But um, but NixOS is really easy to install too. And I'm doing a follow up article on my Great. why people love NixOS, yeah. stepping you through how to install NixOS and um, how to install yeah. software and stuff like that. Yeah, but it really is. We'll add that to the links because we can. Edit yeah, yeah. Them. It's just it's just a handful of commands. Um, I think if you're a developer and you know how to edit config files, which come on, we all do, yeah. um, it's not even scary. So yeah, yeah, I think that's it'd be really fun. All right. Well, thanks again very much for your time, Mike. And uh, I, uh, it's so exciting to have uh, have a guest here on Code and Optimism. Thank you for having me. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that interview. I certainly enjoyed making it. I hope that it is the first of many on this channel, and most I just hope it's helpful. So. Once again, thank you for spending your valuable time here with me. And remember, all problems are solvable with enough knowledge.